Hello and welcome to this edition of our daily devotions. My name is Geneviève Beauchamp and as we always do, let us begin with some beautiful music played by Jonathan Spivey. Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Today we are continuing in our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 6, looking at a single verse, verse 24. Let's hear the word of God. No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this, my friends, is not an easy verse. It's not one we read and pat ourselves on the shoulders and say, oh yes, I'm doing this already. What's next? Oh sure, it sounds easy to say that we serve God fully, but does our tax accountant report the same thing? Morgan Roberts, our wonderful friend and pastor, uh, told us a story a few months ago uh, about uh, these wonderful people. He, he was talking about the, this couple that l l seemed to be living so poorly. And what happened is they were living on 10% of their wages and giving 90% to the church. Now, maybe these two are allowed to say, yes, we're doing like the verse asks us to do, high five, we're doing that. But it's just not an easy thing for us to do. When I moved here uh, to, to the United States, about 20 years ago, I had just finished my bachelor's degree in piano performance. As I was trying to figure out how to go on with music in my new community here, I decided to pursue an artist diploma with my same university in Quebec, while also beginning a master's degree here and continuing with piano performance. I had two professors, two masters of music, I would have normal semesters in Tampa, and then I would travel back home for a week uh, every few months and receive daily lessons with my professor there in my Canadian university. And the program there was very flexible. It seemed like a great idea to me, but it soon became very clear that I couldn't make them both happy. Um, unlike, unlike what the verse says, I really loved both of them equally but I was under two masters. I would have them both criti critique the same music I was learning, and soon my scores were filled with corrections from one professor to the other. One would say, mm, you need to phrase this musical line like such, and this note toward the end is the peak of the phrase, 
while the other would contradict that with completely contrasting idea. No, this is how you should shape it. Peak early and then come down gently and slowly. When my Canadian professor started using colored pencils in my music books, which still makes me chuckle every time I look at my old music, I realized it was probably best for me to decide to just pursue my master's degree here and drop that program in Canada. My music scores started looking normal again. No more professor wars. I just couldn't serve them both well. Being wealthy is not the issue in this verse. Wealth gives opportunities to honor God in ways that impact more people. But do we really give it all to God? Or does God get a percentage of what we earn? This is like the parable of the rich fool told in Luke 12, verses 16 through 21, in which a rich man had great soil and he was harvesting a lot and he didn't have enough space to store his crops. So he tore down his barns and was going to build bigger ones so he could store his extra grain. Then he'd have plenty for the years to come. He could take it easy eat, drink, and be merry. God called him a fool and told him his life would be over that night and questioned who would get what he had prepared for himself. God reminds us that this is what happens to us when we store up things for ourselves instead of being rich towards God. In my life, I've experienced some years of wealth as a child and also years of having very little Growing up, we had many years of having more cars in the driveway than we had drivers in our household, including a fancy gold Cadillac with gold velvet seats. I mean, this was the car. My dad was a professor in college until very recently. He was an accomplished jazz pianist who performed several nights a week. My parents were involved in Amway and pursuing some kind of very big goal. But then we experienced an abrupt collapse due to our house financing that had to be renewed in a year where the rate was at about 20%. They tried to stay afloat for as long as they could and despite well-paying jobs and huge efforts to survive it, it all crashed. We lost all of it. The house, the cars, the valuable items. Our big home wasn't ours anymore. We were now in a small apartment near the mall. We saved the piano by telling them that it had been a gift to me from my grandmother. I was 14 and it taught me to work very hard and to appreciate everything I have. And that I didn't need all these things. It was hard, but truly a gift because I understood then that the stuff didn't matter but God did have my back. And perhaps I still suffer from those days of seeing things taken out of my house, and I end up hanging on a little bit too tightly to my harvest and my grain. But don't we do that a little bit anyways? When we give to the church, we do it right, and we think, here's my 10%. And the 90% will go to my bills, my retirement, my travels, my kids, my safety net. Listen, money is not easy. I've heard so many people who went on mission trips to poor areas come back and be in shock and state that those who did not have much seem to experience a different, le different level of genuine joy as happiness truly comes from the relationships and the people that hold on to each other tightly in their struggles and who appreciate every little blessing. So the answer is probably not the reverse tithing as the couple we talked about. It is such a powerful story, yet this is not how we are asked to live. God also doesn't expect us to live a monastic life where we abandon everything we possess and experience poverty, a life of prayer, solitude, and of hard work. Some feel called to it, but the reality is that our world must continue to grow and to evolve. 
And it probably doesn't mean to abandon our vacations, as we also need to step away from it all sometimes to come back stronger and renewed. But it is a verse that calls us to revisit our allegiances and to question truly who we serve. What we have belongs to God, and we should simply remind ourselves of that daily. Then give thanks for what has been loaned to us and be grateful for the ability to make a lot of money. None of it will follow us to the kingdom of heaven, so let us serve our God fully, help those in need, and always find our joy in giving rather than in holding on. Let us pray. Our God, we want to serve you fully, but it's not easy. We love our things, we pride ourselves for what we have earned and how much we have. And even though we give, we sometimes do it to fulfill an obligation, sometimes to make us feel better about ourselves. Give us that joyful giving heart. We thank you for all that we have, and may we in turn give you all our riches. Amen.